As if Justin Trudeau didn't already have a lot of problems going on, the world's most popular man, Elon Musk, now has a bone to pick with the Canadian Prime Minister. Musk has put out on X the following statement, and I quote, Trudeau is trying to crush free speech in Canada. Shameful. Musk's comments have been prompted by a recent development in Canada where the Canadian government is mandating the formal registration for online streaming services, a move that is aimed at imposing regulatory controls. Elon Musk re responded to a tweet by a Canadian journalist that read, and I'm quoting once again, the Canadian government, armed with one of the world's most repressive online censorship schemes, announces that all online streaming services that offer podcasts must formally register with the government to permit regulatory controls. Well, if you hear the Canadian Prime Minister, he's actually all about free speech. This is Justin Trudeau as recently as the G20 summit in New Delhi, where he once again spoke about the importance of freedom of speech. Let's quickly listen to what he had to say. No, they both came up uh, over the years uh, with uh, Prime Minister Modi. We've had many conversations on uh, both of those issues. Uh, obviously, Canada it will always defend uh, freedom of expression, freedom of conscience, uh, freedom of uh, peaceful protest. That's something that's extremely important to us. At the same time as we're always there uh, to prevent violence, to uh, push back against hatred. I think on the issue of, uh, of the community, it's important to remember that the actions of the few do not represent the entire community or Canada. As recent as two weeks ago, he said freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, and peaceful protest, that Canada would always work towards upholding all of those values. Now, you'd wonder how this man could ever, quote-unquote, crush free speech, right? He's clearly all for it. But the truth is, Justin Trudeau is all for freedom of speech and expression when it comes to Khalistanis and Khalistani terrorists using Canadian soil to hold referendums, to threaten Indian diplomats with death, and to vandalize Indian missions and consulates. He is all for it when Khalistanis want to attack Hindu temples as well as Sikhs in Canada. But Justin Trudeau's freedom of speech comes to a very convenient halt when people of his own nation want to peacefully protest. The photos that you see on your screens are from February last year when Canada was rocked by the free convoy protests against COVID-19 vaccine mandates and restrictions. The protest was largely peaceful, but not only did Justin Trudeau unleash the Canadian police on protesters, he also imposed an emergency which, as per some, gave draconian rights to the Canadian government against the same protesters. Canada's emergency against its own citizens came just a few years after the country had raised concerns about the farmers' protest in India. Well, Mr. Trudeau, here's a reminder that there was no emergency that was ever imposed in India, even though the protests went on for months. So this man who wants to be the torchbearer of free speech, who literally came to India and once again told us on the Khalistan matter that, listen, we are all for free speech and there's nothing that we can do as far as these protests, Khalistani protests in Canada are concerned, he is now under attack by people of his own country for trampling their right to free speech and expression. The larger question, of course, is why is Justin Trudeau's hypocrisy always so clear yet so hidden from the world? We take this conversation forward with Ambassador Pradeep Kapoor, Gautam Mukherjee, Professor Madhav Nalapath, and joining us from Canada is Daniel Boardman, a journalist. Let me begin with Daniel. Daniel, thank you so much for speaking to NewsX and giving your perspective to an Indian audience. We'd first, of course, like to understand what really has happened in Canada. What are these laws that have been brought in that a lot of journalists have now spoken out against? Thank you. This has been going on for a while. This, this, this government, this liberal government, Trudeau's liberals, have had a very censorious impulse from day one and a very clear pathway towards what I've been calling monopolizing the flow of information. So you hit it right. He's about free speech when it comes to Khalistan. And, you know, if, you know, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood wants to protest something or if far left radicals want to do something, if it, if it fits within the liberals um, ideological purview, 100 percent, it's a Western country, free speech to the max. If it's anything that doesn't fit within the narrative, it's uh, it, it, there are completely different rules apply. So the hypocrisy you've outlined, we don't go into that. 
this has been years in the making and it's been going, it's been a key push of liberals. It started with the $600 million media bailout that Justin Trudeau literally said he's providing hundreds of millions, now billions of dollars to the media to preserve their independence. That's right. The government's going to subsidize the media to keep it independent. This is Trudeau land. So now the major media stuff, anything with on newspapers or TV, the traditional media, all of it is is now propped up by the liberal government. And you saw that come to fruition during the Freedom Convoy, where the government narrative was completely disconnected from reality. And those of us independent journalists on the ground got a lot of attention because we were able to just live stream what was actually going on and and expose that. Step two of Justin Trudeau's plan to crush free speech, uh, lawfare. He would attack independent media outlets like Rebel Media or True North Media with frivolous lawsuits, ban them from places. And yes, they won in court, but that takes years and tens of thousands of dollars to fight. And that was sort of the punishment. So there's a carrot, there's a stick. The biggest problem the liberals have when they want to control the flow of information is you, 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 everyone watching at home. You have a cell phone, it connects to the internet, you can technically be a media company. So we have social media out there where people can disseminate information. And this is where the liberals have tried these new streaming service acts and online censorship stuff, all done under the guise of friendship and helping out independent media. There was Bill C-18, which forced Google and Facebook to pay us as independent media for the, the service we provide. But that's not how it works. Google and Facebook already gave us a free service to disseminate information out there. And it makes no sense for what? Every article we post, Facebook has to give us a dollar, right? But then how many articles could people post? They'd go out of business. And the liberals knew this. We tried to warn them, but that was the plan or it looked like the plan. So now there's no more written news on Google and Facebook. The National Telegraph, our ad revenues got destroyed a month ago uh, because the two biggest ad revenue sources were just ripped away from us. And it's, it's hard. And now they want to censor podcasts and put it under the CRTC. The CRTC is this antiquated, bureaucratic, nonsense system. It was old before the internet was invented. It's still in charge. And what they want to do is take this old radio regulator and these bureaucrats and put anyone who now has a podcast or anything that's monetized on the internet in Canada, they want to put it under the purview of the regulator. And that's what we're, we're looking at. So it's not going to be a, we're not censoring free speech. We're not stopping it. We're just, we're helping. So they're not going to rip it away and, and delete us. They're just going to put us under a mountain of bureaucracy and make it nearly impossible for us to say something. But not impossible, just nearly impossible. And then the mainstream media, CBC, Global News, they'll all benefit. They'll all get government subsidies. They're helping write the law. Rogers and Bell, the major telecom companies, they're helping write these bills. They have 100 lawyers on retainer every day, so they get all the loopholes. They can do it. It's, it's us, the independent media, those of us who don't have millions of dollars on hand. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real transparent attempt to destroy any dissenting voices in Canada and make sure the Canadians remain as ignorant as possible on a majority of issues and can only get their news from the standard television, hyper-controlled, uh, old-school media. And people have been seeing that happening. This is just the latest step along that plan. Right. And a lot of people are pushing back. I mean, uh, me and, and some comedians, we're arranging a protest uh, next week because we're just fed up uh, with all of this. And free speech is, it, it, is a, it is a fundamental value of, of a functioning society. And I, I so believe in it. And I, 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 I am a free speech advocate in Canada, in India, everywhere. And it's under attack. And, and we're about to lose um, this value in Canada if we don't stand up. And you hit it on the head. Justin Trudeau is an absolute hypocrite on this. I don't care about Calistanis needing to run around harassing Hindus. That, that's not a priority to me. But they have the utmost free speech to, to the level of legitimately threatening widespread violent ethnic uh, rows. And this is allowed, and those of us just wanting to write a news article on, you know, the carbon tax, we're being treated like criminals. And it's, it's so, so scary to be, you know, in this industry right now, because you never know when the rug's going to be pulled out from under you, when you right. get some sort of success, or you finally be able to monetize something, or get a bit of a falling here, here, and here, because the, this Trudeau government is always looking for a way to so pull the rug out from under those in so, independent media who okay. have dissenting voices. Okay, Daniel, I have to just, you know, just to bring in a little bit more clarity for our viewers as well. I want to understand, you're saying that these laws that essentially control the larger media organizations by putting in money and subsidizing them, while at the same time, 
uh, they also take away a lot of, they bring in laws to take away your uh, revenue as independent journalists. You're saying a lot of this legislation was brought under Justin Trudeau? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Trudeau's been in power since 2015, and and this has been a, a major push. Yeah, this is all new uh, Trudeau liberal laws, and they're it, it is a bit complicated because we're, we're you know we're dealing with like you know since 2015 we're dealing with you know four or five major bills, all of them sort of connected in a way, and it will take a while to parse out to show you. But they're essentially laundering authoritarianism through different processes, so it's not a direct hand straight from the government. But they'll usually outsource something to like an NGO that they fund or, you know, in this case, the CRTC, a bureaucracy, get them to make some nonsense rules, get us all tied up. And then the whole system collapses in a way. And, and, and then, yes, they've they provided hundreds of millions of dollars to the friendly news outlets um, to keep them going. These, these Canadian antiquated news media outlets, the, the big ones, they're losing money. They're hemorrhaging money. No one cares what they have to say. Um, you know, if you just look at the experts they bring on this issue, you'll all go insane watching, you know, five minutes of, an, of a Canadian TV s s hit on, on, you'll be like, what, what country are they even talking about? I, I don't, I don't recognize this, hmm. this India they're talking about, but this, this is, it's, it's, it is a longstanding sort of complicated push towards internet censorship that has been, uh, I would say a priority of the Trudeau liberals um, since they've got office, like quashing free speech or, or monopolizing. Um, let's say, let's be charitable. Fixing the news right. is, has been a priority. Okay. Daniel, if you can just help explain this to us, maybe through some sort of a case study or an example, what really happens, say, when, um, you know, you write a piece that is considered unfriendly by the government, by the Canadian government under Justin Trudeau. So for that, <clears throat> you could get it out there, right? So, I mean, I can publish on the, we can, the National Telegraph can publish any article right now, hmm. right? I, I mean, I, I mean, I, you know, if, if it's crazy, if I go across the line, yeah, you can be sued for defamation and this, this and that. But it's more the, you know, it's been the general attempt. So right now, if I publish an article, it just goes on X and Twitter. Um, in right. Canada, right? You can't see that on Facebook and Google, the two biggest news sites in the entire world, unless you buy a VPN in Canada, right? You, you need a VPN in Canada to see the news on Google. Like, so what they've basically done is they've said, you know, yeah, maybe there's some good, friendly alternative media journalists and maybe there's some bad ones, but they've kind of just said, you know, it's, it's too, let's say, too, too risky to have people doing this. So in order to help the media, they just created a system where no heterodox voices can even reach the masses. Um, and you know, this is why I'm so happy that, that Twitter or X whatever is now owned by someone else because at least we have one site um, in Canada that we can feel somewhat confident has a bit of a anti-censorship anti bent to it. So, I mean, you put out an anti-Trudeau article right now, okay. you can't go on Facebook and Google. So who, who's even reading it? Absolutely. You no, know, you're right about that. Who's actually reading it? Because Google is the largest uh, uh, search engine still. But Daniel, uh, at the same time, when you say that the Canadian public then over the past many years is largely ignorant, if you can just take some big example from the past, something major that happened in the country that was perhaps a big goof up of the government, what is it that was then being reported on the matter? Um, I mean, the Freedom Convoy that you brought up, I think, is the best example of this. Um, I have never seen some, some, I've seen them, I've seen media misrepresent stories, but this was like anti-truth. Um, any rumor to smear the, the people there was picked up on. Uh, there was a story that was later retracted, but is still true in the Canadian media, where they said the truckers were going into the homeless shelters and stealing the food. And that was a lie, like I was live streaming. There was so much free food at the Freedom Convoy, I showed lines of the homeless were so happy because for the first time in Ottawa's history, the homeless were being taken care of by all these truckers. You didn't have to pay for a single meal in the Freedom Convoy. Someone would give you a hot dog or whatever. There was such a surplus of Canadians coming in to provide food and shelter to, to those sort of holding the line. Um, it, it was really so, a sight to behold. So that was an anti-truth. There was a story of Freedom Convoy people trying to burn down a hotel room. They caught it on camera. It was people with like purple hair and they looked clearly like neo-communists. Turns out they were neo-communists trying to smear the Freedom Convoy. 
but all the major NGOs and, and, and the news outlets ran with this story. And then, you know, uh, politicians started to, even after it was debunked, say, make this claim, which then the in, intelligence agencies sort of copied what the politicians said and then media reported what the intelligence agency said about the politicians. And then this, this sort of cycle between law enforcement, media, and the government, where one of them would make something up, the others would latch onto it, then they would retract it, but then they would report what the other two were saying. And then you had this, this spiral of fake news going out of control. And then you had us independent journalists on the ground just pointing our phones saying, you know, this is what's actually happening here. But a lot of Canadians don't watch independent media. And, you know, I still deal with family members mm -hmm. who watch the CBC or CTV and saw the Freedom Convoy as like the, the end of the world, the apocalypse, this violent insurrection. Uh, and it, it's just not what happens. So you have this disconnect between people who watch alternative media in Canada and watch live streamers and people on the ground and people who watch um, mainstream media, like the antiquated news channels. And I mean, it, it's two different worlds in Canada. It's just, it's just two different worlds. Okay. Daniel, before we let you go and bring in um, our Indian experts as well on the matter, I'd just like to understand from you, why do you think then, like I said in the beginning as well, why do you think Justin Trudeau's hypocrisy, which seems to be very clear, is so well hidden from the rest of the world? Why is it that uh, this man is always seen as this torchbearer of freedom of speech and expression? Um, I don't know. Um, you could say maybe it's the global dominance of what you would say is the modern left. I mean, he has ideological allies like Jacinda Ardern in, in New Zealand. I mean, she's basically a female Trudeau. Um, and you have this sort of, I know, I would say like friendly. I mean, he seems, I guess, like this woke surface, right? He, he gets up there and he can say stuff in 2015, sunny ways, diversity, we need more women here. You mm -hmm. know, saying nice sounding things, which people like. I mean, no one wants, you know, everyone wants women to have the rights that they do in the 21st century. No one wants to go back to 1322. Um, but it's all smoke and mirrors with him. It, it, it's all... Lies. And I think for the most part, people are disinterested in Canada. People just don't know what's going on. And I mean, there's a lot of like, who cares? Like, do you live in America? Who cares what's happening in Canada for the most part? But now you're seeing just how, you know, how noxious and corrupt a lot of this can be. And the, these problems that you allowed to fester, I mean, we're going to talk about the Calistani one. It's one of many in Canada. Um, and now it creates international incidents. And yeah, it's, it's maddening. And I've been saying it for years. This guy who says diversity, you know, minorities, protect them, kindness. He's allowing Sikhs and Hindus to be horribly harassed, discriminated, attacked um, with impunity and and focusing on mean tweets people saying online and making sure that I can't write an article uh, and put it on Facebook. Like, it, it's maddening. And I wish the world would, and I'm happy the world is finally starting to see what we've been trying to raise awareness of in Canada for a long time. But I mean, that's a question the world has to answer. How did they not see through Justin Trudeau? I don't know. Um, you'll, have to ask, you'll have to ask the rest of the world. Right, absolutely. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us on the broadcast. Uh, we've tried to have a very in-depth conversation with you to just understand and give you the space and the platform that you say that you don't get in your own country. Perhaps through us, uh, your message will also uh, reach the rest of the world. I'll also bring in on that note, Professor Nalapath. Professor Nalapath, uh, I've been keeping all the other panelists waiting because we it was important for us to hear, um, you know, our friend from Canada, Daniel, what he has to say and what is it that they're going through. When you hear Professor Nalapath, everything that's happening in Canada, what is really the first thought that crosses your mind? It's essentially an attempt to entirely control all forms of media. And honestly, uh, most of us didn't even know that this is happening in Canada. Well, you know, Justin Trudeau is a perfect example of a politician who will do anything to remain in power. He is consorting with terrorists. He is permitting uh, hate speech. He is permitting the open advocacy of violence. Uh, he is making it, as uh, Daniel very correctly said, uh, unsafe for, for, uh, for the overwhelming majority of Sikhs who are moderate and for the Hindu community. To, to live in Canada. So at, and you're, at the same time, there's an influx of radicals that are coming in from different parts of the world into Canada. And it, Canada has become a kind of a, of a free zone where for, for radicals. And you're seeing the changes in Canada. 
you know now even in the smaller towns in canada you are seeing the drug menace you are seeing gangland wars you are seeing extortion from canada free speech by the way according to justin trudeau and you know news access has mentioned that extortion being committed on on citizens of uh, other countries by canadian citizens on canadian soil with impunity now, all this is happening at the same time this is what justin trudeau defines to be free speech the fact is he will define anything in any way designed to keep him in office for another 10 or so years anything so the the i mean the, that is the truth about justin trudeau these laws are there because he's uncomfortable with the truth now he's uncomfortable with the fact that canada is now slipping into a situation where drugs and crime are becoming what they they have been in some locations south uh, of the canadian border canada was a very safe country at one point in time mm -hmm. it's no longer a safe country and this is all happened because of the way justin trudeau basically is being manipulated by the fringe elements now you've seen how you know well motivated well funded fringe elements can motivate much larger groups of people and this is where for example the chinese communist party comes in you right. look at vancouver for example vancouver is the headquarters of the station chief of uh, of those entities in china that are basically tasked with the idea of creating problems and and trouble in the united states they don't function from inside the united states because then if they're caught they'll be in trouble but in trudeau's canada they're perfectly safe so the reality is i said is that canada has become a, a bigger security threat to the united states than mexico and it's a tragic really tragic but it's obvious one fact is obvious justin trudeau must have read george orwell very very closely he's a student of orwell and he's a practitioner of the double speak that orwell uh, wrote about absolutely ambassador pradeep kapoor bringing you into the conversation sir and just taking up uh, you know picking up where uh, professor nalapad left it off if this is the true situation of canada today then really what will be the turning point and where do we see canada headed from here uh, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, devika and good that you have uh, brought this up on your channel it's a very important subject and for me it has been a very learning experience to listen to daniel and to professor nalapath also as to what extent the canadian government has slipped in its uh, you know democratic norms values ethics and here is a western society a western country uh, you know which is trying to say that uh, we are a rules based country and we are a democratic country and we have free speech and we support freedom of speech so in the context of khalistan particularly and their support to khalistanis i have been speaking on many occasions in your channel also as to uh, the amount of hypocrisy that exists in the system but i didn't know that it was so deep rooted in the system that uh, there is no level playing field today for independent uh, media independent journalist independent broadcast and it comes as a big shock to me what i see uh, from what i've heard so far is that a society which is heading towards very serious problems if this is the way they are going to be dealing with issues and as you very rightly said when there are farmer protests in india and they are dealt with in a very democratic fashion that is painted as you know autocracy and dealing with it in a very harsh manner and when the same farmers protests are held in canada and they are dealt with in a very harsh fashion it is painted as if it's a very uh, you know dire situation for the country and that sort of declaration of emergency was necessary to deal with those sort of protests and stifle free speech so there is no level playing field and i think it is for the canadian citizens to start voicing their opposition to this by you know making sure that in the next round of elections which are around the corner uh, such people who are uh, doing you know absolutely saying one thing and doing something else 
have one set of rules for themselves and another set of rules for the others or the rest of the world or other countries uh, they are thrown out and cast into the dustbins of history forever right because if canada becomes such a threat i mean in some ways it resembles pakistan because if you are giving sakar to self declared terrorists who are responsible for murdering people in other countries and in your own country if there were 329 people on that flight which took off from canada and i think about 279 were canadians and then the perpetrators of that horrendous incident are allowed to go scot free and live in canada for so many decades scot free and this is a very shameful act so i right. don't know how it will end where it will end but it has to end very soon and one way it can end very soon is if there is more understanding and more discussion about this within the canadian society and the canadian people then decide that this is high time that these people are thrown out of power and all the things that they have done which are wrong are unraveled so that it again becomes the society which everybody in the world was proud of as a society with a lot of freedom of speech freedom of but in a genuine sort of way not in this divided sort of way that we have our freedom of speech but we will not give you your freedom of speech yes so that that is where i want to you know uh, stop okay. here and and back to you devika okay gautam mukherjee if you are still with us on the broadcast i just like to direct the next question to you when we speak about uh, freedom of media or freedom of journalists a lot of times india uh, a lot of you know fingers are pointed at india time and again okay let me take this with professor nalapath professor nalapath i'll leave this last question with you sir uh we're constantly having to defend the freedom of journalists in india the freedom of news and media outlets in india because a very clear narrative has been painted that all of media in india is completely you know been bought over by the government and people who are close to the government and therefore there is no freedom of speech and expression how is it that this has been happening in canada for so many years and the rest of the world just doesn't know look devika let me point out about vaccines the fact is that you know 3 years is not enough time to really test all the after effects of a vaccine and you you india has been in the lead in vaccines under prime minister modi india has supplied more vaccines to the rest of the world than possibly the next five countries combined but at the same time there's never been a vaccine mandate in india there's never been an effort to basically impose a vaccine mandate in, in in india and very importantly there was no lockdown in 2021 there was a huge outburst of covid-19 there were a lot of calls for lockdown there was no lockdown there was only that lockdown in the, the previous year so you can see the relative freedom that is enjoyed by the indian citizen as compared to a, a country where those who are arguing against vaccines are are put at risk of uh, of arrest and worse so the talking about freedom of speech the fact is very simple the same people who are saying there's no freedom of speech in india they not only on platforms in india but platforms around the world they go around crying that there's no freedom of speech in india and that india is a demonic dictatorship and they're going around they're coming back to india they're going back to these countries the fact is there are groups in these countries that love to hear bad things about india i mean uh, i don't know what the situation is now but back in the 90s uh, ambassador kapoor in the diplomatic uh, enclave in delhi if you basically spoke good things about india and hor- uh, worst of all good things about the government even narsimhara's government you were not really welcome in these cocktail parties and these cocktail parties are wonderful parties really marvelous people you know really lovely people friendly people and therefore those who uh, mocked india their own country those who criticized their own government criticized their own political parties they were lionized completely lionized and you have now a situation where in different parts of the world those who go out and mock india hmm. and talk about freedom of speech and it comes on the internet it comes in india we all read about it and what happens they come back they go back 
and basically they have their cake and eat it too, so to speak. But the reality is, quite frankly, that we have an elected government. If you have a problem with the elected government, what you're saying is that the people of India have, you know, have not elected the government that you would like to see elected. And if that is basically democracy, that the people are functioning correctly, and if they're electing the people whom we want to get elected and not anybody else, that is democracy. That's a very weird definition of democracy. Okay, and uh, I'm running out of time, but just one last minute to Daniel. Daniel, since you're with us uh, still on the broadcast, I'd just like to understand from you. Ambassador Kapoor raised an issue of, of course, the elections now coming up. Um, just to get a ground perspective from you, how is it looking like for Justin Trudeau in terms of popularity? Very, very, very bad, which is good. Uh, I've never seen a poll where the Liberals and the NDP, so the two left-wing parties, together, they're polling below the Conservatives, if you combine them. Um, the Liberals, uh, you've seen him 20 points underwater. He, he's deeply unpopular. Him and Jagmeet Singh, the two of them have created sort of, I call it a Faustian bargain to stay in power until 2025. Trudeau gets protection from any corruption he ever does because if he controls the government, uh, there's no like independent monitor. He gets to choose the, the judge, jury, and executioner. And Jagmeet Singh gets his pension at 2025. So there you go. Okay, it's, it, all it's, right. It's, Thank you so much, Daniel, for joining us uh, on the broadcast to give us that perspective all the way from Canada to our Indian citizens watching as well as the global citizens who tune into NewsX. Hopefully that was as much an eye-opener for us as it has been, of course, for you as well. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel, hit the bell icon.